welcome Jeff with a warm applause on stage. <laughs> he works for yeah. Tactics Attack. <laughs> and we'll talk about uh, bias in data and racial profiling in Germany compared with the UK. It's your stage. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, okay. So my presentation is called Profiling and Justice, Disaggregating Data by Race and Ethnicity to Monitor and Evaluate Discriminatory Policing. Um, in terms of my background, um, I've done research, um, doing mostly quantitative research um, around the issues of racial discrimination for a long time. Um, in New York, at the Center for Constitutional Rights, I was working on um, looking at trends and levels of um, uh, use of force by police against civilians, and also on stop and search um, against civilians. And then more recently, for the last 18 months or so, um, I've been working as a research consultant with Tactical Tech, um, looking at issues of data politics and privacy. So this is kind of like a merger of these two uh, areas. In terms of um, what this presentation is going to be about, there's going to be three takeaways. Um, first, that um, we're dealing with the issues of privacy and also discrimination, and both are fundamental human rights. Uh, but there's tension between the two. And important questions to think about are, when does privacy uh, concerns exceed or take precedence over um, those of, of discrimination or vice versa? Um, two, um, that data is political, uh, both in the collection and aggregation um, of data, but also in terms of how the categories are being created. And then three, uh, that data ethics are a complex thing, that things aren't so black and white all of the time. Uh, so what is racial profiling? The term originates from the US um, and refers to when a police officer suspects, stops, questions, arrests, or, um, you know, or, or other stages of the criminal justice system because of their perceived race or ethnicity. Uh, after 9-11, it also refers to the profiling of Muslims or people perceived to be Middle Eastern. And in German, uh, there is no direct translation, so the term racial profiling quotes is used a lot. Um, in parliamentary hearings and also in court documents. So the problem that we're going to talk about um, is that because of the lack of data in Germany, um, there's no empirical evidence to monitor and evaluate trends in discrimination. Uh, this um, is creating problems for both civil society in terms of looking at these levels and trends over time, but also from an individual perspective, it becomes difficult for people to file complaints. Uh, in Germany, the only way to file a complaint officially is to go to the police department, which introduces uh, power dynamics, um, you know, challenges and additional barriers. But also, if you're an individual, you have to show that there's um, a trend, right? That, that you are part of another, uh, a long-standing story. And without this data, it becomes difficult to prove that that's happening. Um, so what we need, or, or what some people are calling for, is having this data at a state and also at a national level. And this ratio that I'm putting here, uh, referring to policing, is looking at the rate at which people are stopped over um, this census figure of um, the demographic share of the population. And you really need both, um, the first being on the police side and the second being on the census. So that you know, if you only have one, um, if you only have the rate at which police are stopping people, then you actually can't see if this is discriminatory or not. And if you only have the census, then you can't see that either. So you really need both. Um, the European Commission, International Labor Organization, and academics are all calling for these, uh, the creation of standardized um, and comparable data sets. And I'm not going to read these out, but um, I can go back to them later if you're interested. But what I'm going to talk about is comparing uh, the UK to that of Germany. Um, so in Germany, uh, in 1983, there was a census, or there was a, an attempt to make it a census, uh, but due to widespread resentment and disenfranchisement, uh, fears of surveillance and lack of trust in uh, state data collection, uh, there was a big boycott, right? Um, or people deliberately filled in forms wrong. Uh, in some cases, there was even bombings of statistical offices, or people spilled coffee over uh, census forms to try to deliberately ruin them. Right, as a couple of other presentations at the conference have already said, uh, this was found to be an unconstitutional uh, census um, because of the, the way that they were uh, framing it, uh, comparing these, um, the census to uh, household registrations. Uh, 
Uh, and so, and you know, the census was delayed until 1970 or 19, yeah, 1987, uh, which was the most recent census until the most recent European one in 2011. Uh, this Supreme Court decision uh, was really important because it established this right for informational self-determination, uh, very important for um, privacy in terms of Germany, uh, you know, until today. So what kinds of information is being collected? In Germany, we have pretty standard kind of demographic information, things like gender, age, income, religion. Uh, but what I want to talk about in particular is country of origin and country of citizenship. Uh, which are used to determine uh, a person of a migration background. And this term, person of migration background, generally refers to whether you, your parents, or your grandparents, so first, second, or third generation, uh, come from a migrant background. Right? And this, this term is used oftentimes as a proxy uh, for ethnic or for racial diversity in Germany. And this is problematic because you're using citizenship as a, as a proxy um, for looking at racial and ethnic identity. And it also ignores the experiences uh, and identities, the self-identities uh, of people who don't fall into this first, second, or third generation, right? People who may uh, identify as black German, let's say, but are fourth, fifth, or sixth generation. Uh, they're just ignored in this data set, so they fall out. Uh, also, it's difficult to measure these at a national level because each state has different definitions of what constitutes a migrant background. Uh, so we don't have these at a national level, but also within states, there's no way to compare them. Of course, not having that data doesn't mean that there's no racism, right? And so in 2005, for instance, we see that neo-Nazi incidents have increased 25%. The NSU case uh, coming out, but still going on in, in court proceedings. Um, you know, the xenophobic attacks, but also the way in which uh, these crimes were investigated uh, at a state and at a federal level, um, and the way that it was botched, um, in addition to showing, you know, that um, you know, racism now in general is at a higher rate than it has been for the last 30 years, uh, and much more recently seeing the rise in arson attacks on, on refugee centers. Uh, there's been over 200 attacks this year so far. You know, all of these show that not collecting this data doesn't mean that we don't have a problem. Right, so the UK by comparison, uh, in 1981, um, there was the Brixton riots uh, in, in an area of London, um, and these arose largely because of resentment towards uh, the way that police were uh, carrying out what they called sus laws, or, or people being able to be stopped on uh, suspicion of committing a crime, uh, carrying drugs, uh, having uh, a weapon, or, or, or so on and so forth. Uh, and so in the aftermath of the riot, they came out with this report called, called the Scarman Report. And this found that there was much uh, disproportionality in the way that police were carrying out their stop and search procedures. Uh, so for the first time, this required, or the, uh, one of the reforms that was instituted was that uh, UK police started to have to collect data on race or ethnicity um, uh, during the stops, right? During, during when they stop a person, they have to start collecting this data. And, and then you have a baseline that's being established. Uh, around the same time in the UK, right, we have uh, the 1981 census. And in society, they were having a lot of debates around whether or not they wanted to have this, this uh, uh, collecting this baseline national level figure, right? Because we need these two things for this ratio um, in order to monitor and evaluate levels of discrimination. Uh, but, you know, there was a lot of um, opposition to this, and many found it to be, quote, morally and politically objectionable. But not for the reasons we'd think, right? People found um, objections to it not because of asking this question, but uh, because of the way that the question was phrased or the categories that were being used. Uh, and they did surveys between 75 and about 95 and found that among um, marginalized communities um, and, and minority ethnicity groups, uh, there was actually a lot of um, support for collecting this kind of data. Uh, they just wanted to have it phrased to be different. <laughs> And so in 91, they started to collect the data. Uh, they put this, this race question in. And here I have in 2011, the most recent census, uh, some of the kinds of categories that they wanted to also include. And they've changed over time. Um, so for instance, like white Irish people felt that they also were discriminated against. And they uh, experienced things differently than uh, white British people, for instance. So having things broken down further um, would be helpful for them in terms of highlighting discrimination that each specific demographic faces. 
Um, so around that time, 91, right, 93, we have the murder of Stephen Lawrence uh, in unprovoked racist attack. Nobody is ever convicted of that, but um, what's important is that we have this McPherson report that came out. And it developed a lot of recommendations, 70, and most of them were adopted. One, to be collecting this at a national level and to be comparing these. In 2011, they stopped mandating that you had to collect this data at a national level, so none of the data from then going forward can actually be trusted. Uh, some forces continue to do it, but not all of them, so you can't actually compare them between forces. The same year, we have these London riots. Uh, the Guardian and LSC put out a report called Reading the Riots, uh, where they did a lot of interviews with people who participated, and they found that most of the people who participated uh, had feelings of, um, that they were mistreated by police, or that, or, or that there was um, racial discrimination in terms of the policing practices, that they weren't being uh, treated with respect. Right, so to put some data to that, um, before this was removed, um, they, they, there's two different types of stops in the UK, right? There's pace stops, uh, where you're stopped uh, with reasonable suspicion. And among that, you have, for instance, black people stopped at seven times the rate of white people. Asian people, Asian referring to predominantly Southeast Asian in the UK, at twice the rate. And section 60 stops where you don't have to actually have reasonable suspicion, right? And when you don't need to have that, you have much, much higher rates, right? 26.6 times the rate uh, of white people, uh, black people are being stopped at, um, right? But the State Department's even coming out and they're saying, well, but there's no relationship between uh, criminality and race or criminality and ethnicity. Right? In fact, like if people are being stopped at these rates, it's, it's in the wrong direction. You have white males in particular who are, who are offending at higher rates, who are using drugs at a higher rate, uh, who are possessing weapons at a higher rate, but that's not who's being stopped. Um, there is a connection, though, between uh, race and ethnicity and poverty. Right? So you can see here, they call it like BAME groups or black, Asian, and minority ethnicity. And you can see that among like wealth and assets, uh, it's much, much lower uh, for non-white households. Unemployment rates are much higher um, as well. Income is much lower. And so I like making maps, and I think maps are really cool because uh, you can tell <coughs> stories when you overlay a lot of data with it. And so on the left, I put um, by different borough in London where people are actually being stopped, right, per thousand people in 2012. And on the right, I put where the crime is actually occurring, right? And this is coming from, from UK police. And so you can see that where people are being stopped isn't exactly where the crime is actually happening. And if you're seeing this uh, stop and search as a crime prevention tactic, then we have to question why this isn't lining up, right? Going back to this ratio, um, you know, earlier I mentioned like, you know, having, having the rate at which one group is being stopped over um, that share of the, the total population, <laughs> But we can take it a step further and we can compare that to uh, between different demographic groups. Right? And when using census figures combined with um, police figures, right, we can do things like looking on the left, I, I, I made this disproportionality ratio. So the rate at which black groups as a share um, stopped versus the total population <coughs> compared to white groups right, are stopped. And you can see the darker areas right, is, is where you have a higher rate. So, so when we're talking about those, those uh, seven times or 26 times more likely, right? These are those areas that we're talking about. And the, so, so the darker areas, you can see that when compared to um, poverty, right? People are stopped. Um, there's greater disproportionality ratios in wealthier areas than there are in poorer areas, right? And this is kind of a way you could say almost of, of, of perceiving um, people of color as, as uh, uh, others um, who shouldn't belong in these, in these areas. Right? It's also, you can, when combined with other census information, you can see that you have more um, discrimination, you have more disparities in areas that are more white and also less um, uh, racially diverse. Right? So this is kind of along the same, same kind of a message. Uh, but if it works, fine. Um, it doesn't. Right? UK police is saying that at most they have a 6% um, arrest rate of all stops, uh, and arrests are not conviction rates. Uh, looking for, for, for weapons, we have like, you know, less than 1% of a, of a positive search rate. And the European um, Human Rights Commission, for instance, has called for reform of these practices. The UN has called for reform of these practices. 
and they instituted uh, a, like a reform that called for having a 20% arrest uh, quota, right? And so that could either go positively or negatively, right? Making a higher quota means that you could be just arresting more people that you're stopping more likely or, or, or hopefully, right? It means that you have a, a higher uh, justification or grounds for, for stopping a person. Right, so these are the kinds of things you can do in the UK when, with, with these kinds of data. In Germany, you can't. Um, but I wanna highlight, there's this one case uh, in Koblenz in 2010. Um, there was a, a student, a unnamed and uh, black student who was stopped um, traveling on the train and he was asked to show his ID and he refused. And he said, no, I'm not going to do that. This is, uh, you know, reminiscent of Nazi era tactics, right? Um, and so he was charged with slander, right? And he was uh, brought it to court. Um, and the police officer, um, when it was in court, said, quote, I approach people that look like foreigners. This is based on skin color, right? And so this is for the first time uh, the police have admitted that um, their grounds for doing immigration-related stops are, are, are based on uh, perceived race or ethnicity, right? Uh, the judge sided with the police um, that this was good justification, that it was good grounds, but a higher court ruled that that wasn't the case. <laughs> um, they said, yeah, this is unconstitutional. You can't actually do it. It violates the Constitution. Um, you know, no person shall be favored or disfavored because of sex, parentage, race, uh, language, homeland, origin, faith, uh, religious, and, and so on. Uh, just as a side note, there's been a large movement to remove this term race from um, that part of the Constitution since it's uh, been put in. Uh, and also, uh, the courts dismissed the slander charge. They said, no, the student, like, he's actually able to critique the police, you know, in this way. Right, but after, um, we have the response by uh, the police union, the head of the police union at the time, who said, quote, the, the courts deal with the law in an aesthetically pleasing way but they don't make sure their judgments match practical requirements, right? And so what this means is we see that according to the police union, right, this isn't official response, but this is from the police union itself, right, they say that we need to profile, we need to do this, or else we aren't able to do immigration-related stops. Um, that's, that's crazy, right? Um, they also, I mean, at the same time, you know, when they're doing these parliamentary hearings, they institute these mandatory intercultural trainings uh, for, for police officers. And these are kind of like a, like a one-day training where you, where you go and you learn all about uh, how to deal with people from different cultures, right? Uh, but in some of the interviews that I was doing, they said, okay, well, this isn't an intercultural issue, right? This is a racism issue, right? Um, you know, people aren't just coming from other places. These are Germans. These are people who grew up here. These are people who live here, who know how to speak the language, uh, who were born and raised. Um, you know, and we need to be dealing with this in a different way. Um, however, right, in, in this time, right, we see that racial profiling has become part of the national conversation, <laughs> right? And so this is the sticker that somebody put up um, in, in Berlin on the, on the U-Bahn. It says, you know, attention, we practice racial profiling while checking validity of your ticket. It's not real, but it, but it looks, I think it's kind of cool. Um, Right, so when they were doing this in, in the, these Bundestag hearings, right, they released data um, for federal police for 2013. This is the first time that we have any data that's released. Um, no data has ever been released based on uh, state police stops. Uh, they say that they're not actually collecting the information, so they don't have any to show. Of course, the figures that are released from the federal police are not disaggregated by race or ethnicity. Um, but what does this actually show? Okay, so. Most of the stops, right, over 85% um, are, are border stops, right? Um, border being within about 30 kilometers um, of the German border. So this is actually taking into account most of the German population. Um, but if we're, if we're doing these immigration-related stops, then in, if we break it down by offense, right, then the last two, these are the immigration-related uh, offenses that, that people are committing, right? Um, and we have less than, at most, maybe 1% of people um, who, are, who are found to be uh, positive, right? Uh, meaning that they're, they're found to be violating some kind of offense. It's, again, it's not a conviction rate, um, and people can um, uh, challenge this. For instance, like, you don't have to have your ID on you at all times. You can present it later, and, you know, the charge could go away. Right, but if, 
if we have such low rates of, of um, positive searches, then like why is this happening? Why do we um, feel that with, with such good data um, and, no, and knowing, you know, as good researchers, um, you know, why, why are we continuing this as a practice? And one of the other interviews that I was doing, they found that, okay, well, you know, we know this is ineffective, right? Uh, but this has the effect of criminalizing our communities, right? And whether or not this is true um, is an argument for why we should maybe have uh, this kind of data to show that this is or is not actually occurring. Um, of course, you know, European Commission um, Against Racism and Intolerance and the UN have said, well, you know, even, even among this at most 1% positive rates, these are not um, being distributed evenly. And you have people of certain groups that are being stopped at rates higher than others, particularly uh, black and other, and other um, minority ethnicity groups. Uh, okay, so going back, right, why, um, you know, to the initial question, if we have both freedom um, from discrimination and the right to privacy as these human rights, um, how do we address this tension, right? Um, and how do we ensure that we're making the right decision in terms of which takes precedence? And so I came, or I've, I've thought of three different um, reasons why this isn't happening. Uh, the first being a series of legal challenges, right? Things that are preventing us from um, um, implementing this uh, from a legal basis. And the first, um, you know, there's three exceptions uh, that would allow for this data to be collected. The first being um, if there's a provision in the EU directive uh, that calls for collecting this kind of a data. Um, and within that, um, if you have the consent of the person, um, the, the data subject, uh, let's say, right? Consent is kind of a, a difficult thing and we could have a whole conversation just about that on its own. You know, if you're being stopped by a police officer, to what extent can you actually consent to the data that's being collected, right? Um, but, you know, this is, is put in place um, as, as one of the, the mandatory legal uh, requirements. Or, um, if there's an exception in the hopefully soon to be finalized uh, EU data protection law, uh, that allows for collecting data if it's in the public interest. So you could argue that, you know, we need to be collecting this data because uh, in monitoring and evaluating um, discrimination uh, is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is a problem that we need to solve as a society, right? Right, two, um, you know, as a lot of people here at the conference are talking about, there's a lot of distrust in terms of collecting data um, by the state, particularly sensitive data, right? But, I mean, as many of us are already aware, this data is already being collected, right? And this doesn't mean that we should maybe uh, collect more just because, you know, just for the sake of collecting data. Um, but in terms of sensitive data, um, you know, we're collecting things also like medical data, right? And, and medical data sometimes is interesting um, for looking at trends in terms of illnesses and, and where illness spreads, right? Um, and you can look at this as also possibly, um, you know, a, a, a way of using sensitive data for highlighting uh, and monitoring um, uh, public problems. Right, and three, um, we have, um, you know, these challenges determining which kind of categories we should put in place, right? But like the UK, if something were implemented in Germany, um, I feel as though this would change over time as other groups also want their data um, to be collected or, or, or not, um, and, and um, yeah. So, so, so that's kind of where I'm at. Um, I think that, uh, you know, there are no easy answers in terms of whether we should or should not do this, but I think that at the very least, we should be starting to have these conversations. And I think that it's important to start having these conversations with communities themselves who are being targeted or feel that they're being profiled. Um, yeah, so thank you. <laughs> an awesome talk. I think there might be uh, five minutes for questions. There are mics over there and over there, and whoever has a question, like in the front row, I can come walk to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just wondering in terms of uh, how you're sort of creating this. Um, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you sorry, uh, yeah, of course. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of curious in terms of how you're creating the um, disproportionate demographics, whether it would be worth including other kinds of information, such as sex, age, mm -hmm. time of day they're stopped, because there's possibly an employment bias as I'm well. I'm sorry, I still can't actually hear you. Sorry. Um, whether it be worth including, say, other details about people, such mm -hmm. as their sex, their age, mm -hmm. maybe the time of day that these stops are happening, mm -hmm. as there may be an, a bias towards the unemployed. 
in your, if, if that's possible, you think, with the UK census data? Yeah. It... So, do, so you're, you're asking, do, do I feel as though we should also be including other kinds of demographic data? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I do, but I think that um, I shouldn't be the one who's deciding how to implement these programs, right? And I think that, uh, you know, we should uh, be speaking with communities themselves and having them give their opinion. So if this is something that those communities who feel that they're being targeted or being discriminated against um, want to include, then I think that they should be taken into account. But, you know, I don't know that I should be the one who's deciding that. Okay, next question over there, please. Coming back to the ratio. Uh, to this ratio you've been talking about. Mm -hmm. So you compare census data mm -hmm. to, as you said in the definition in the, fir in the first slide, perceived ethnicity or race. Mm -hmm. So it is an attribution of the persons themselves in mm -hmm. the census compared to attribution per police officers. Mm -hmm. And those n won't necessarily match, I'm not sure. So right, I right, was right, just right. wondering whether you could comment on that a bit. And this is related to the second question when it comes about we don't get this data maybe from the police because mm -hmm. it's difficult for the state to collect it, mm -hmm. but maybe we could get the data from those which suffer from discrimination in the first place. So mm -hmm. do you see any possibility for public platforms? So I was reminded of this um, idea from Egypt, Harassmap, which is about mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The sexual mm -hmm. harassment of women that just made visible with maps similar to what you do actually where this happens, when this happens, how this happens. Mm -hmm. But it's been the, the, the people themselves speaking out and, and making this making this heard. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering whether that maybe is another source of the data you, you would be needing for, for your work. So the first question was talking about whether we should be using self-identified versus perceived, right? Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, they may not line up, right? Um, people can be perceived in a way different than they identify. Uh, some groups in Germany are calling for uh, both. Right, they're calling for um, kind of like a two-ticket um, mechanism, right, where you have uh, people who, are, who uh, put how they self-identify and also how the police are identifying them, right? If we're looking for patterns of discrimination, then, then it may actually be more interesting to be looking at um, how people are perceived, right, than, than how people self-identify. But um, I think it's important to take both into account. And for the second question, I'm sorry, I kind of forgot what that was. Like asking, asking the people themselves for, for data when they suffer from discrimination or yeah. being stopped more. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, I think that's a great idea. And, and um, there was a survey that was actually just done that was doing uh, just that. Um, it, it, the findings haven't been released, but it, it just finished up. That's looking at different types of experiences uh, of discrimination that people are having. Uh, there's also organizations uh, like social worker organizations that have been collecting this data for a long time. Uh, you know, having hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cases. Um, yeah. Thanks.